welcome to the last night of Bible school. We went from three rows to two, spread out. <laughs> I'll try not to take that personal. Um, if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along tonight, we're going to be in the book of Acts chapter 1. Uh, just let me remind you real quick where we've been this week. On Sunday morning, we did uh, Gadara. We called it the Mount of Deception and Decision. Sunday evening, we were in Gilboa, where Saul died. Uh, we called that the Mount of what might have been. Monday was the Capitalist, the Mount of Testimony, where Jesus healed all the people. Tuesday was Horeb uh, with Moses. That was the night we were in the youth room, the Mount of Calling and Supposing, I would call that. Last night, we were on Moriah, Mount Moriah, which is Mount Zion, Jerusalem. And I call that the Mount of Testing and Accounting. Um, I told you last night I had seven to pick from for tonight and had you pray. And I went back and forth a couple times. Here's the ones I had left. Uh, Mount Ararat. Anybody know what happened on Mount Ararat? That's where the ark landed after the flood. And I would have called that the Mount of New Beginnings. Uh, Nebo. Anybody know about Mount Nebo? Not the one up near Somersville. Mount Nebo is where God took Moses and showed him the promised land, but then buried him on that mountain somewhere. No man, no man knows where he buried him, but I would have called that the, the Mount of Vision. You know, without a vision, the people perish. That would have been a great message. Um, and then the other one would have been Ebal and Gerizim. Anybody know anything about Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim? Um, that's the two mountains that are just north of Jerusalem, and they come down into a valley. And Moses had said, but Joshua was the one that followed through with it, they would put half the people on Gerizim and half the people on Mount Ebal, and on one side they would yell out the curses, and on the other side, they would yell out the blessings, and it would have been the Mount of Cursing and Blessing, um, or I would have called it the Mount of Choices. Uh, that would have been a great place. <coughs> Mount Carmel, Elijah, well, that would have been a lot of fun. I'm always tempted by that one because there's so much detail. I would have called that the Mountain of Ups and Downs. Um, that would have been a great message. Mount Hermon. That's where Mount Transfiguration took place. That would have been a fun one. I would have called that the Mount of Evidence because that portrays what the Millennial Kingdom is going to be like. And then obviously there's always Mount Calvary. Uh, I would have called that the Mount of Redemption and Rejection because both things happened that day. Um, but we didn't go with those six. We went with another one. And it's in Acts chapter 1. If you're there, read, read, say amen. I want to pick up in verse 9. Verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, you're with me, say amen. And when Jesus had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. <coughs> Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Notice verse 12, last verse. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. This is the Mount of Olives, also known as the Mount of Olivet. Um, before we dive into the Mount of Olives, by the way, a Sabbath day journey is about a half a mile, is how far it is from uh, the Mount of Olives, the top of it. By the time you come down into the Kidron Valley and come up into Jerusalem, it's right at a half a mile. Uh, kind of steep both ways, where you out. Uh, but but uh, that's all the farther it is. First of all, thanks for coming. How many of you came every single night? That's great. God bless you for it. I pray in some way, somewhere along this week, you and the Lord 
have talked to one another about something and uh, grown some way in your walk with him. Because uh, isn't that the goal of every saint is Amen. to get closer. Amen. Amen. We want to get closer. So uh, before we dive into the lesson, anybody have a great need you'd like for us to pray about tonight? Before we start. Yes, Bob. Steve, uh, Steve Osborne. He's mentioned him every night. Yes, Ellen. My cousin Brian Rice, he's a pastor in Canada in a Baptist church, and he's having heart issues. I'm not exactly sure what, but it was a week's care for him. Okay, Brian Rice. Let's remember him. Dean, let's pray for Grayson uh, Gay. She's a 13 year old girl that has, it's not Tourette's, it's called Rett Syndrome. And uh, she fell and she fractured her hip. They don't know how. You know what's going on, but you know, I don't even know if she even knows what pain and stuff is. So just pray for her and her family that, that you, they can you is know, she a cover Point Pleasant her. Girl? Do what? Is she here in Point Pleasant? Yes. yes. Okay. What's She's her name again? Verbal. Grayson. Grayson Gay. Grayson Gay. Her mom, her mom is Renee Sayer. Okay. Remember that little girl. Yes, Candace. Olivia Joyce, Deweese. Remember Olivia Deweese. Uh, Mary Buck needs our prayers. She was in the ER last night and having some complications. She's here tonight like a crazy woman, but uh, don't tell her I said that, Mindy. But uh, that's Mindy's mommy. Pray for Mary Buck. Virgil Queen, I'm sure, still needs our prayers. Let's remember him. Anybody else? <coughs> remember, tonight's the uh, invitation for the kids been talking a lot about that the concerns of it just pray god's will's done tonight amen amen, amen. we'd love to see some kiddos saved and, uh, we had actually 10 kids turn in their little story i don't most of you may have not heard about that but we asked them to write a story about someone being rescued from perishing and we just explained what that meant and 10 of these little fellers wrote one so uh that was pretty cool we were proud of that so Pray for these kids, amen. A lot of them need a lot of prayer. Anyone else? All right, if not, why don't we stand as we do each night while we pray so you can stretch your legs a minute. We can talk to the Lord. Pastor. Yes. I've got to say it's been such a blessing to be here each night. There's been a, a message in my heart every night every day the next day and I want to thank you and I want to thank God for giving me those messages and I thank God that I listen Danny Hall will you pray for these needs brother Thank you, brother. You may be seated. So the Mount of Olives, uh, the Mount of Olives, if you're in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount looking east, you see the Mount of Olives. If you leave Jerusalem, go out the eastern gate, also called the gate called Beautiful, and you head, head in an easterly fashion, you're going to cross the Kidron Valley. And immediately at the foot of it, you're going to come through the Garden of Gethsemane that we're, so many of us are familiar with where Jesus prayed the night that he was arrested. And then as you start up that mount, that's the Mount of Olives. And at the very top of it, you'll come to a little town called Bethpage. And if you top over it just a tiny piece, you'll come to a very familiar spot in the scriptures, the little town of Bethany. Bethany is where... Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus was from. That's where the whole Palm Sunday 
initiates where Jesus comes off the Mount of Olives and they praise him and that's where they sing Hosanna and they put the palm branches. That's when we celebrate Palm Sunday. All of that happens coming off the Mount of Olives. Um, it's uh, quite a place. It's where Jesus wept over Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. Um, he picked that place 40 days after he rose from the dead. He was on planet Earth 40 days after he died and rose again. For 40 days, he hung around a little bit in Jerusalem, but mostly in Galilee. And then at the end, he ends up back in Jerusalem, goes up on the Mount of Olives. And as he's given the great commission to the disciples, that he's, they're going to be witnesses for him unto Judea, then Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. As he finishes talking that little story, um, the Bible says he just starts going up. He doesn't disappear. He just starts being lifted away from them. And as the disciples watch him leave, and by the way, I'm reminded there are no storm clouds in the sky. Let's give Jesus a hand. Amen. Amen. Uh, it looked bad last night going to bed for us, amen? Uh, but, but God showed up and did a great thing. Only one night we had to forsake our assembly into the team room. Uh, I praise God for that. In uh, this time of year, with all these storms, he was good to us, amen? amen? We don't want to cease to praise him for that. But Jesus is taken up, and as they watch him, is he waving? That's the kind of stuff I wonder. Is he waving? Is he going, hang in there, boys. I'll see you in a bit. Bye-bye. <laughs> right? I don't know, but it had to be kind of cool, right? Yeah. And the disciples are doing what all of us would be doing. We're waving, right? Maybe come back. Maybe not just like that, but something, right? Anybody think they're kind of sad he's leaving? I mean, I mean, this is kind of the end of sight. And now it has to become all about faith, right? And all of us, we can't wait till this faith stuff ends and it becomes sight for us, right? We get to finally see him to be absent from this body. If it's through death, we'll be present with the Lord, right? Right? Precious in the sight of the Lord are the, is the death of his saints. That's the Old Testament because he knows the minute we die, what we get to experience is going to be out of this world amen literally literally and figuratively out of this world um they're taken up and and as he gets so far up as they're looking up two angels appear and say why are you looking up well see look up you'll see why we're looking up right it's a no-brainer to me why they're looking up and they say this same jesus as you see lee is going to come back in like manner um, that's what we want to talk about tonight the Mount of Olives is the Mount of Ascension but it's also the Mount of return and and that's kind of why just I used to love this I tell this all the time when I was sitting there when especially when I was a young guy and the preacher was preaching and he would tell me how God gave him the message for that day because I, I lamented a little bit last night. I wasn't sure what to do. I, I just read for you all the mountains I had sitting in front of me. And I loved all of them. There was a great message in all of them, but I didn't know where to go. But I'll be honest, I've been leaning toward this one for quite a while. But this morning we had to clear off our driveway. We had some people come and seal it for us. And we told them we'd leaf blow it before they come. And when I went down there, there was a branch right next to the driveway. So I just picked it up to throw it, and it had thorns on it. And I got me a, a big one. I mean, it's huge. Actually, it's not much. It's a boo-boo. That little thing hurts. And I got thinking, Lord, does this mean you want me to do Mount Calvary and talk about thorns? That was a little, that's what I do. I spend 20 minutes walking back up our hill going, is that what this means? Did you give me that so I would think thorns? Are you guiding me? This is hard to know sometimes. Amen? Yeah. So here we sit, trusting God that this is what he wants us to end with this week. If you were here at the sunrise service, how many of you were at sunrise this past Easter? Okay, we, we talked about this very message, this idea of the return of Christ on top of the Mount of Olives. Now, 
Most people love prophecy. It's growing on me. It's not something I always really enjoyed, to be honest. There was too much symbolism. It was hard to get my mind around it all. But in my older years, the more I'm appreciating it because it's it's about what's to come. And I, the older I get, the more excited I get for what's coming. Amen? Uh, because I got a lot more coming than I've been. All of that is a bunch of heartache back there, it seems like. There's some good stuff. But for the most part, it's a lot of heartache back there. And I'm looking forward to what's to come. So let's talk about what's to come so we can talk about the Mount of Olives. Before the Mount of Olives and Jesus comes back and touches down on it, a lot's got to happen first. Namely, the tribulation period. Okay, And we've talked about that a little bit this week. Uh, whenever Christ decides to come get his church, and the Bible tells us the only reason he's not come yet is because he's long-suffering that men would repent and come to him. Amen. He's got a, a, a group of people that's yet to come in. One of these days, the last soul will be saved, right? And the trump will sound, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's what our faith teaches us. That's what's going to happen. It's the graves of all those believers that ever were buried. Those bodies are going to be snatched up, caught up in the twinkling of an eye. All of a sudden, just whoop, right? And then we which are alive and remain. Don't you really hope you're part of this? Yeah. Honestly, I really, really, really hope I'm part of the rapture. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not just saying that. I'd be all right if it was right now. Yeah. Amen. I'm not just saying that. I'm ready to push the button. God, give me the button. I'll push it. We'll go on. Amen? This place doesn't feel like home much anymore. It just doesn't. I don't have a death wish, but I got a homecoming I'm looking forward to. Um, the dead in Christ will rise, and we which are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet in the air. Amen. And that's where I usually sing that old song. There is going to be a meeting in the air. You heard it. If you have, you're old. You're old. If you're wondering tonight if you're old, if you know that song, qualify yourself as old. See, that is not the second coming. All my life, I thought the rapture was the second coming. I'm not blaming my preachers. I'm blaming me for not listening, okay? I'm sure they taught me right. I just didn't listen right. I thought the second coming and the rapture were synonymous. They meant the same thing, but they're not. The second coming is not the rapture. Amen. When the rapture takes place, we are caught up to meet him in the sky. It doesn't tell if it's 10,000 feet, 20,000 feet, 30,000. We don't know at what elevation... But we're going to meet Jesus with those Old Testament and the church saints. We'll all meet in the air with Jesus. Amen. We'll go on to heaven. Two things are going to happen to us in the seven years that while earth is going through what it's going through, the church is going to have two things happening in those seven years yeah. in heaven. The first one will be the judgment seat of Christ. That's where you and I will stand before Christ and give an account, not of our sin, right? The Bible says our sin has been cast into the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. Our sins are gone. Somebody say praise the Lord. Amen. They are gone, and they are gone forever. I will never, ever stand and give an account of my sin because Jesus paid it all. Amen? And that's why all to him I owe. I am redeemed tonight. I have been bought by the precious blood of Christ, and he take, took away all my sin. God took it all off me, put it in him, and took his righteousness and put it in me, and that's the substitutionary death of Christ. He took my sin. I got his righteousness. That's why, as Romans 5 said, I have been justified by faith, and now I have peace with God. It's not momentary. It's done. Okay? But I will give an account at the judgment seat of Christ. If it's not for sin, Dean, what's it for? I'm glad you asked. It's for your works. It's not what you did to get saved. 
as so many people think. That's all been taken care of. It's what you did once you got saved yeah. is what we'll give an account for. The Bible says there's going to be, it qualifies them as two types of works. Okay? Every saint really ought to listen to this. Yeah. If you call yourself a Christian, you really ought to listen to this because this is what you and I will be merited for in heaven. Okay? The Bible says that our works will be tried by fire. fire. Okay? And what he's going to do is he's going to put our works through the fire. And if they're wood, hay, and stubble, what will wood, hay, and stubble do in fire? It'll burn up. It'll go bye-bye. It'll be no more. Amen? It will be gone. So there will be something, and I always say, imagine a conveyor belt on this side, goes through a fire, and out the other side is another conveyor belt where whatever went through there comes out over here. And over here, there's going to be just picture all these bags, big brown Aldi bags, full of your work, stuff you did under the umbrella of because you were a Christian. Maybe it's your choir, maybe it's, maybe it's teaching class, maybe it's just coming to church. Maybe that'll make it. All of this stuff we did because we felt like God was asking us to. And it's on that conveyor. And you and Jesus are going to stand there and shove that stuff into the fire. And if it's wood, hay, and stubble, it won't come out the other end. But the other qualification is if it's silver, gold, or precious stone, it will not only survive the fire, it will be refined by the fire Amen. and come out the other end as a reward. <coughs> as a reward. You say, Dean, what makes something, if it made it to heaven and it's a work and it's there, Jesus recognizes it was something you did, what makes it something that survives fire or not? Come on, Here's the answer. It's not what you did. That's what's in the bag. It's the why you did it. The heart, the intent behind your actions. Jesus cares a whole lot more about why you're doing it than what you're doing. Amen? And you say, Dean, what's all this stuff comes out the other end? What do you do with that? Um, and some of you old saints know the answer to that. We're going to follow the four and 20 elders that's mentioned in the book of Revelation they fell down and cast their crowns at the Lamb's feet. It's your only time. Now, this may not mean a lick to you, but again, the older I get, the more this means to me. That's the only time in eternity, all of eternity, you're going to be able to hand the Savior something tangible, a gift from you, something you worked hard to provide as a gift for him. That crown isn't yours. It's his. It's your gift. Once through them seven years we're done with that part of our first part of eternity, then we'll go into what's known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. Um, that's where we get hitched to Jesus. I don't completely understand that, but I believe it. Amen? And we Amen. will be united with Christ in such a way the church will that will become his bride, and that's just in time for him to come back to the Mount of Olives. See, every single one of us here, if we're saved, what we're about to learn about will be with him. Because we'll have either died and we're there for that reason, or we'll have been raptured and we'll be there for that reason. But either way, if you're a Christian sitting here in Point Pleasant right now, what I'm about to teach you about, you're going to be a part of. When he comes through the sky to come back to his second coming. See, the first, the rapture's not a coming. He only comes to the sky. He doesn't touch planet Earth. That's what makes it a coming. Okay? A lot of times you'll hear it called the second advent of Christ. The first advent was when he came as a babe in a manger. He came to Earth. God came in form of Emmanuel. God with us. The second time he touches planet earth, you and I, I will be there. Yeah. You say, preacher, how do you know that? By faith. Yeah. By faith. It's the only way I know it. I don't deserve it. I haven't earned it. But my Bible tells me if I put all my faith in what he did at Calvary 
and I trust him and his righteousness to get me to heaven, I'll be there. That's what I'm banking on. I believe. My faith thinks that's true. Amen. And I have based my whole life and everything I do in my life on that belief that this is a story worth telling. And the more I tell it, the more excited I get about it and believe it's true. We have something worth living for. Amen? Amen. I don't feel like I'm getting cheated out of anything. I feel like this is the blessed life. Amen. I really, really, really do. So, if you want to learn more about the second coming, you got to go back to Zechariah chapter 14. In the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 14. Because it's a really fascinating part of Scripture. Zechariah 14. If you haven't found it yet, just stare at your Bible as if you have. We won't know. Ain't nobody gonna come look. Uh, you can trust me. I'll read it. You can you can count on it. I'll I'll, I'll not misinterpret this. Uh, but if you have found Zechariah, I want to read chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. If you're with me, say amen. amen. The day of the Lord, just a second. The day of the Lord is when his vengeance is ready to be poured out. That's when his judgment is loosed. That's the tribulation period on earth. Okay? The first three and a half years are called the tribulation period. The second three and a half years are called the great tribulation period. The tribulation period is made up of 21 judgment that God's going to have on this place. And praise God, we'll be gone. Amen? Seven seals that will lead to seven trumpets that will lead to seven vows or bowl judgments. Okay? This is what happens. Verse 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, literally means raped, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Don't, don't turn, just if you're making notes, write this down. Revelation chapter 16 is where you learn about the sixth bowl. It's the seals, then the trumpets, then the bowls. This is the sixth, the next to last judgment, the sixth bowl. The sixth bowl is described as the river Euphrates dries up. Three frogs, three, three frog-like spirits come out of Satan's mouth and they go forth to deceive all the rulers on planet Earth to assemble to come battle against Israel in Jerusalem. That's what the sixth judgment is is for the Euphrates to dry up, and God does that on purpose so all the kings of the east can cross it on dry ground so they can make their way to Jerusalem. So a battle can take place. This is that infamous battle of Armageddon. Okay? That is the sixth bold judgment. Now notice verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon where? The Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave, literally split in the middle thereof toward the east and toward the west. And it shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it to the south. That is the seventh bowl. The final judgment. There is a great earthquake, and that's in Revelation 16 as well. Literally, Zion... Mount Zion, Mount Moriah, where we were last night with Abraham, Ophir and Isaac, that mountain will literally be split into three different parts, okay? And part of that split will affect the Mount of Olives. When Je I said that backwards. When Jesus hits the Mount of Olives, it's going to cause that earthquake that's going to cause the city of Jerusalem to split, it, split into three parts. Yeah. Literally, when his feet touch... And remember, we're with him. We're going to get to be eyewitnesses to this great day. I cannot wait. Amen? 
I am looking forward to that far more than any Disney trip. My daughter loves Disney and I like to pick on her. I think Mickey's way too expensive. Hannah, do not amen her. If you like Disney and you know it, say amen. Good. You're all with me. We rule. I cannot wait. It's going to split from east to west. Literally, the Mount of Olives is going to shift north and south to create a valley. Where Jesus lands, where Bethany and Bethpage are today, right outside the eastern gate of Jerusalem, the mountain is literally going to move. That's not just going to be it, but Jerusalem is going to have a catechismic shift because if you read Ezekiel and learn about the millennial temple that Christ is going to establish, it is literally one mile square. Right now, the temple mount is only, it's less than one mile square in totality all the way around it right now. So the whole area has got to be transformed in a major way just to make room for that temple. God's going to change everything about the Mount of Olives and Mount Zion when Jesus is touched down. Because he's not coming back a humble, lowly servant. He's coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we're with him. And guess what? We're all wearing the same stuff. We're all in, we're all clothed in fine linen, white and pure. And we're all on horses, right? And he's leading the way. Amen? Amen. And, and those of you who can't ride horses, just hang on. Get in the back. Get back there and just hang on, man. You'll be all right, right? Something tells me in those seven years during the judgment seat, maybe, maybe after you're done getting judged, we take riding lessons. Let's hope, amen, for those of us that's never ridden much. They don't want to be the guy falling off about halfway between heaven and earth, right? We'll have new bodies, right? Like unto Christ. It'll be all right. It'll all work out. I'm just trying to get you excited about what not might be, what will be. We'll be with him. The mountain will split apart. Jerusalem will be changed in a second. And Jesus will destroy all the nations of the earth. We won't have to do a thing, y'all. We're not going to be doing any fighting. The battle of Armageddon is going to be won by our Savior, our King of Kings, our Lord yeah. of Lords. And he's going to do it with the sword of his yeah. tongue. Amen. I don't know how all that's going to work. But, you know, the most notable fact about the battle of Armageddon that we've all been taught, if you've been taught much about the battle of Armageddon, is how high the blood runs yeah in the Valley of Jezreel. And as I told you, we've stood on Mount Carmel overlooking the Valley of Jezreel. And this is what I literally stood there and thought about. How many gallons of blood would it take to fill that valley up to the horse's bridles? The sword of Jesus' tongue is going to annihilate all those who chose not to believe and persecute his people, the Jews, during the tribulation period. Um, when that happens the Mount of Olives splits there's this earthquake in Jerusalem the Bible says out of the temple now how quick the, Jesus has this temple built we'll see but out of it to the east is going to flow water now as it leaves Jerusalem and what used to be the Mount of Olives, now this great valley, that water is going to run through that valley and about 20 miles, 20 miles from Jerusalem to the Jordan River, that water is going to flow. Now what I love about this is the Bible teaches us something about this river that's flowing outside of the temple in Jerusalem toward that gap in the Mount of Olives. One of, the, one of the angels said, measure, okay? So as Zechariah, I'm sorry, Ezekiel is the one who writes about this in Ezekiel chapter 47 about the river. When it leaves the temple, it is ankle deep. You go 
a thousand cubits, which is just over a quarter of a mile, and by there, it's knee deep. You go another thousand cubits, which is another basically quarter of a mile, now it's waist deep. By the time you get another thousand cubits, it's over your head, and Zachariah said, no, Ezekiel said, I'm sorry, I'm messing you up. Ezekiel says, by then, it's deep enough to swim in. I don't know about you. Do you remember getting to swim when you were a kid? See, nobody I knew had a pool. We broke. That's right. Amen. We were impoverished folk down there in Gap Town. Nobody I knew had a pool. We went to Crowdell. Do you remember? Goose Poop Haven. You remember? They had built us a little beach, right? Put a tire out there with some wood on it and said, that looks like fun. Enjoy. And we did. I love going to Crowdale. Mom would wake us up in the morning. Dad would be working. Instead of going to the garden, we were going to Crowdale with my cousins to swim all day. I thought I was in heaven. We got to go to the concession stand maybe once, maybe with a dollar. All day. And you thought all day long, what am I going to get at the concession stand with my dollar? You remember these days? Amen. I remember these days. When... I remember when any time I got to swim, that was the greatest thing in the world. When I hear swimming in this crystal clear water, where it used to be a mountain, now it's this beautiful river. And then it goes on to say, Ezekiel tells us that both sides of that river are lined with beautiful trees, many of them. See, you'd have to live in the Middle East to appreciate this vision of this beautiful crystal clear river that is massive and it's all the way over your head and it's got these beautiful lush trees on every both sides and then it is so much water that it goes to the Jordan River, turns south and it turns the Dead Sea that is so sodium based, so many minerals, nothing can grow in it today. It's going to turn it into fresh water. I love that. A place that there was no drinkable water will now be a place to go swimming. And there's going to be all kinds, a multitude of fish. I'm not a big fan of fish. In the sense of eating it, I don't mind catching them. Amen? Amen. Eating them, I need a little batter, right? <laughs> a little Long John Silver. Uh, <laughs> Captain D's ain't too bad. But, you know, the older I get, the more I can try to eat it. I don't mind, uh, what is that called, the, the salmon, huh? No, the salmon at the hospital. We always got salmon stir fry in the hospital room. It was pretty good. It didn't taste like fish. As long as it don't taste like fish, I don't mind it too bad. But it's going to be full of fish. And there's going to be people casting nets all the time for all the fish they want. And then, the last thing Ezekiel mentions about this river is there's going to be fruit trees all around it. And every month, the trees will bear its new fruit, one right after another, Amen. after another. And the fruit will be for food, and the leaves will be for medicine, both preventative and corrective. You'll never have to worry about being sick as long as those leaves are on them trees. And we're going to get to see it all happen at the Mount of Olives. Yep. So if you're up here, which one you want to look at the most? Watch Jesus leave or watch him come back? Um, just remember, and the, the reason I picked this one tonight, because number one, I love telling the story. Either, either I didn't pay attention when I was younger, we didn't preach on this enough, because that's really cool stuff. I love learning about that nowadays, what's about to come. And the fact that I'm going to be a part of it. Don't you love that? Amen. I guess the question is, do you believe you're going to be a part of it? Um, and that's where tonight probably matters the most. I want to read for you something we've been reading a lot at church lately. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 16. It says, the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Let's, can, let's just be real for a minute, everybody. We, this is our last night, our last few minutes together. If you call yourself a Christian... Okay? The Bible says that your spirit, your, your, your innate you, 
Something about the inside of you, the Spirit of God bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. Somehow you know that, okay? It's not a guess. It's not a hope so. It's a, there's a sense you can't deny. It bears witness that you are a child of God, okay? Now, there's a couple ways I know this. What time is it? I, I can't tell out here. It is 7.32. 7.32. Listen, we, we have an enemy that, that tempts us all the time. And we have a God who is testing us all the time. Amen. The simplest way I've ever put it, and it makes sense to me, is we've got a God who's always trying to get us to do sit-ups, right? He's always growing us. Always trying to make us stronger. Always trying to get us to be better than we've been. Right? Anybody, anybody notice that side of life with God? Yeah. Is he's always trying to mature you. That is the truth of sanctification. He's always working on you. No matter how old I am, he's working on something. Please somebody amen that if that's yeah. true in your life too. Yeah. It's like he's always working on something. That's part of what the Bible says. He's, he's always, until we go home, going to be war. How does your spirit bear witness with his spirit that you're a child of God? God says, whom he loves, he chastens. You ought to know that. Amen. I've said many times, when my dad hollered out the window, Gary Dean Warner, get in this house, all my friends went, Phew. right? Nobody stood with me. That was my dad. Amen. And I had to go face my dad. You ought to know what it is to face the God of heaven because you're not perfect. Amen. Amen. I should have got more than that. Do you all not live with you? <laughs> Amen. I bet if I rode 10 miles down the road in the car with you, I could tell you aren't saved all the time. Amen. <laughs> or maybe get your children in a cranky mood, right? We might see the real you come out of. Uh, I don't know what it takes, but we all know where we mess up, amen, where our weaknesses are, what God's trying to grow us in. Hopefully this week, you've sensed the God of heaven pushing you a little, pulling you toward him a little bit, right? Satan's always trying to get you to mess up, and God's always trying to get you to do better. God's saying do sit-ups, and every time you come up, as I like to say, the devil's there going twinkie. Yeah. <laughs> amen? And I got to tell you, it's hard to do sit-ups when there's Twinkies in the room. That's right. Amen. Aren't we all more drawn to Twinkies, church? Yeah. You know what I'm saying. It's a whole lot easier to curse somebody than it is to bless them. Can I give them an amen? Ha. Amen? Yeah. It is. It's a whole lot easier to hold a grudge than to forgive. Can I get an amen? amen. Huh? It's a lot easier to hate than love. It's a lot easier, it's a lot harder to hold things together than it is to split it up. God says sit-ups, the devil says twinkie, yeah. and so many of us go, yummy, 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 yummy. But if if your if your spirit bears witness with his spirit that you are a child of God. That's what you need to settle tonight. Can you sense his spirit because he's in you? The Bible says when you get saved, you receive the spirit of God. That's part of our inheritance. It's the down payment of everything else is we get the Holy Spirit now. Yeah. Okay, It's the down payment of the big deal that's to come. It's our assurance. It's already ours is we have the spirit. And the way that bears out, honestly, it's, there's positive too. There's, there's comfort. When nothing else will get you through. Nobody can comfort you. Somehow the God of heaven shows up and he does stuff this world can't do. The peace of God that passes all understanding, that keeps your heart and mind. You, it's indescribable, but it's undeniable. The peace of God that comes when you need it. Amen? Um, but the chastisement of God is probably the one I talk about the most because it's the one I've always sensed the most. Um, I've said this many times. I probably sensed God more in my life when I was away from Him than I do today when I'm trying to live for Him because He was constantly chasing me. 
I'm so thankful he did that for me. But then it goes on to say, if you can be convinced that bearing witness inside of you, then if you're a child, you're an heir. And if an heir of God, then join heirs with Christ. If so be that you suffer with him, that you may be glorified together. If we suffer with him, we'll be glorified with him. That's where our church is right now in our normal studies, is talking about the glorification of the saints. Someday, the Bible says, we will be glorified as Christ is. The body he has, we will get rid of this old vile body and we'll have a new body like unto his. We're going to get that. And it's going to be a glorified body. Like he's shown on Mount Transfiguration, you and I will shine with him when we come back, when he comes to set up his kingdom that we just described at his second coming. But... Part of the knowledge that you're really his is that you're suffering with him. And we're just starting to get into what that looks like in 2023 for a saint to suffer because we don't have snipers in trees, praise the Lord. Right. Amen. Amen. Nobody's trying to burn down our church, but there is suffering in our day and age. If nothing else, it's a spirit of willingness to suffer. Whatever it costs me, I'm in. No matter what it may cost me, I'm in is the sense. And if that's the case, here's what we need to know tonight. Paul said, for I reckon that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. If nothing else on this last night, I just want to make sure we all leave here thankful. We know where we're going. Yeah. Amen. And we know whatever we go through down here, that's going to be worth it. Amen? Amen? One of my favorite old hymns is when we all get to heaven. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And my favorite verse, I always like it, is just one glimpse yeah. of him in glory will all the toil of life repay. You believe that? Yeah. Do you believe it's still worth it? Yeah. Absolutely it is. And I feel like a, a, a coach in a locker room. Come on, boys, let's get it. Amen. Let's not give up now. We got to fight the fight. Amen, 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 amen. We've been blood, sweat, tear for a week. Let's go get it, get it, get it, get it. Amen. Amen. Uh, all the neighbors are going, what are they doing? We're celebrating our faith. Amen. Celebrating our faith. Uh, thanks for coming. I said tonight there'd be an invitation. I'm not going to get radical with that. I believe if the God of heaven's calling you, you know it. I don't have to talk you into it. I just want to tell you, if you know that he's getting a hold of you right now and he wants you to become part of his army, just come up when we're done here and tell me, say, Pastor Dean, I think God's talked to me this week and I want to give my life to him and to this faith. And I want to be serious the rest of my life about serving him. If you know he's drawing you, calling you to this life, all you have to do is be obedient and step out and say, I believe. I believe. Amen. God, as I come to you now, I thank you for this week. In, in a most basic sense, I thank you for the weather. We could have been run inside several times, and that really messes up a lot of things when we have to take the teen spot and they've got to find an alternative spot and Lord you're blessing that group and the last thing we want is to make Jimmy's have a challenging time teaching them so Lord we needed to be out here and we needed it to be comfortable for people to sit uh, and we thank you for those big trees that somebody planted a long time ago that gave us shade this week God thank you for holding off the rain and giving us the week we've had but Lord beyond that for the spiritual things Lord, I pray that you've met some needs in some lives that sit here this week. God, I pray that you will receive all the honor and the glory. May there be much thankfulness in people's hearts towards you for what you've done for them as a result of what they've heard this week. May you be lifted up in their lives more than you've ever been lifted up. May they truly worship you as their Lord and Savior in a genuine way. God, help us all. Help us not to get weary in well-doing. Help us to keep pressing forward. Help us to never, ever look back, but believe that the best is yet to come. God, help us to be an ultimate-minded people, not an immediate-minded people. We ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming.
God bless you for it. If you are leaving, just pray everything goes well here in a few minutes with the kids. Amen.